what is ADHD in my life? How does it present itself? I think I'm successful because of it, not in spite of it. And I want to look at it as a superpower. I want to look at it as something to leverage that makes me different and unique. Hey, my name is Jenna Kutcher, and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing numbers, and helping you to navigate both the messy and the magical seasons of this thing called life. I'm a small town mama who took a $300 camera, grew a successful photo biz, and now I work from home and run a seven figure online business. I teach you the tried and true secrets to building a career you adore. Shy away from the real talk? (laughs) No way. Money, hardship, growth, loss, and marketing are all topics we discuss here. Think of this as your one-stop shop for happy hour with a gal pal mixed with business school. Pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. Hi, I'm Jenna Kutcher. I lose my phone at least three times a day. And if you listen closely, you can literally hear my Apple watch pinging in order for me to find it. I procrastinate on life admin things to the point where opening an envelope stresses me and it causes me anxiety, even when it's like junk mail. And when I finally do those things that I've put off for way too long, like unpacking my suitcase or applying for my passport renewal... I basically berate myself that it took me so long to do something so crazy simple. I create unnecessary stress for myself and others in my disorganization and my inability to complete tasks with a lot of details. I function well with little piles of the things in my life and struggle when things are all put away. My name is Jenna and I have ADHD. And today's episode of the Gold Digger podcast is all about that. I love sharing podcast recommendations with you. If you love Gold Digger, then you'll love Nudge, hosted by Phil Agnew. Learn the science behind great marketing with bite-sized 20-minute episodes packed with practical advice from world-class marketers and behavioral scientists. Nudge is fast-paced and insightful with real-world examples that you can apply to your business. I loved this recent episode where Phil shares how our subconscious mind calls the shots and how to bring more awareness to your thoughts to help you not make stupid mistakes. His words, not mine. Nudge is brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. Listen to Nudge wherever you get your podcasts. Today's episode of the Gold Digger podcast is brought to you by Nikon. Nikon's new Z30 is the camera creators have been waiting for. Head to NikonUSA.com slash Gold Digger for details. You know, what's really fascinating about this stage of my life is I am too old for a quarter life crisis, too young for a midlife crisis. However, when I look at this year, (laughs) I wrote a book. I've had a baby. I got Invisalign on my teeth. And I also was diagnosed with ADHD at the age of 34. And I've thought about recording this podcast for a little while. But honestly, since I got my diagnosis, I've really taken some time to myself to journal and dive deep and learn more about it. And so this episode is coming from a place of someone who literally was diagnosed a few months ago and who is in the very introductory learning phases of ADHD and what it means. And I want to give you a little bit of backstory here because this podcast, the one that you're listening to right now, literally changed my life in a massive way. I honestly had never thought twice about ADHD until I recorded a podcast for Gold Digger with Tracy Otsuka. Now, Tracy has her own podcast. It's called ADHD for Smart Ass Women. And my podcast producer had listened to an episode of hers and was like, Jenny, you have to get Tracy on Gold Digger. She is fascinating. So in spring of 2021, I interviewed Tracy and I did the whole interview for Gold Digger. I loved her information. I loved her content. I love how she shared about ADHD. And the moment we stopped recording, Tracy, I will never forget this. Tracy goes, Jenna. You do realize why I wanted to come on your show, right? And I said, no, why? And she goes, because I believe that you have ADHD. And I remember my mind was blown. I was like, wait, what? And she's like, Jenna, I have listened to your show for years. And I know some of the things that you have to do in order to be productive, in order to be effective. And a lot of the things that you have to do in order to focus are signals to me that you might have ADHD. And it was so fascinating because I'd done her entire interview 
through this lens of just curiosity. And I finished the episode thinking, wait a minute, was all of that about me? (laughs) I literally emailed my podcast producer that day and said, can you mix that episode? I don't care if it's unedited. I need to listen to it back. And I need to listen to it back through the lens of she could be talking about me. And when I did that, I was blown away. That same day I sent that unedited episode to my mom and I said, mom, you have to listen to this. I think I might have ADHD. And so in the spring of last year, I feel like my eyes were opened thanks to this podcast, thanks to Tracy. And what's fascinating is after sending that episode to my mom, it opened up a lot of conversations within my family. Something interesting about ADHD that I didn't know is that it has to have been present in childhood because it's a neurotype that you're born with. So even if it presents differently for you in adulthood, there still have to be some traits present from young age. And so when my family was all together, we started talking about this. And what was really interesting and something I had no idea is that my dad has always thought that he has ADD or ADHD. And no one brought it up to us. It was never talked about. I mean, I knew stories about my dad as a child as being a little boisterous, maybe a little distracted, sometimes being coined the bad student. But we had never really discussed this possibility that this was something that was in our family and that was likely passed down to us kids. And Tracy's podcast episode on my show, which we'll link in the show notes today, really opened up these dialogues, these conversations within my family where it was like, wait a minute, I think all of us kids have it. I think all of us children in my family have it. And we all have different ways that it's presenting in our lives. But when you peel back the layers and look at a lot of traits, I think that we all have ADHD. So it was something that I've been thinking about for the last year. But I wanted to get actually diagnosed because if you listen to my recent episodes about my health and things like that, I do really well when I know that something is specific for me. So generalized health knowledge only takes me so far when I know that there is something specific for me, my body, my brain. I take it a lot more seriously. I I learn about it. I want to learn different ways to deal with it, to face it, to optimize it. And so earlier this year, I went through this whole screening process. And I remember the day my inbox said, your results are in. I closed my eyes, took a deep breath and opened them and knew that I had ADHD. And it's really interesting because although it's been something I've been thinking about over the last year, having the diagnosis kind of took me by surprise in that it felt grounding and affirming to dive into the content with the lens of like, no, this is me. And this is something that I have. And this is a part of my life. And now as I learn about it, I can learn how I can empower this part of how my brain is wired. And it also makes me feel not so crazy for some of the things that I've struggled with my entire life. Like the more that I learn about it, the more I normalize some of the things that I've hated about myself. And also the more that I learn ways that I can use this part of myself as a superpower and not some detriment. I recently told someone like, I was just diagnosed with ADHD. And they were like, Oh, I'm so sorry. And I was like, No, no, no. Honestly, this feels really empowering. Like I think that this is a good thing for me. And now that I get to dig in, I'm excited. So I want to walk you through some of the things that I've been learning. And I also want to do this through the lens of I am not an expert in this space by any means. I am literally sharing this as someone who recently was diagnosed and has gone off the deep end in trying to learn more about this. And so this entire conversation is like the entry level conversation about this topic. And it's something that I hope to speak about more as I uncover more about who I am, uncover more about ADHD and uncover more about how I can utilize it in my life and business in a powerful and productive way. So one thing I learned is that there are three ADHD types. So the first one is ADHD predominantly inattentive presentation. So inattentive type ADHD was previously referred to as ADD, which is what my dad has always connected with. And it now all falls under the label of ADHD. So you don't actually hear ADD as much, especially with the younger generation. But people with this type of ADHD have trouble with organization and completing tasks. 
Now, the second type of ADHD is ADHD hyperactive impulsive presentation. This type of ADHD makes it difficult for people to sit still. So this is what you think of when people are really fidgety. They're always like bouncing their leg, things like that. People with this form of ADHD are generally very impulsive and have trouble listening to direction. So in girls and women, this hyperactivity can turn inwards and become less obvious from the outside, but may come out in the form of fidgeting, talkativeness, and interrupting. And then the last one is ADHD combined presentation. And this is people with combined type ADHD, where they have symptoms of both or different types of ADHD presenting in their lives. So there's the inattentive kind, there's the hyperactive impulsive, and then there's the combined presentation, something that I didn't know before I was diagnosed. Now, what's really interesting is that women with ADHD tend to show more inattentive and internalized symptoms. And when I learned this, I thought it was fascinating. You know, there is a lot of data around ADHD specifically in girls and women. And it's really, really interesting when you dive in. But one thing that I learned is that a lot of times women with ADHD internalize their symptoms. And so that's why even when I brought this up to my family and when I told my mom the day I texted my mom and I was like, Hey, mom, just wanted you to know I am officially formally diagnosed with this from a board certified person who analyzed all my charts and everything. And my mom was like, I am so sorry. You know, I didn't know. And I was like, Mom, don't apologize. Like, I think that a lot of this was internalized. I think a lot of it was things that I just learned to cope with without ever questioning. And so here are some of the symptoms that women with ADHD tend to have. So one difficulty paying close attention to details or making careless mistakes. And something really important to note here as we walk through these is that everyone experiences inattention or forgetfulness to some extent. And that is a normal human experience for everyone. The difference for ADHD is it's more severe and frequent. Like it literally impacts your daily functioning and it happens even when you are trying your absolute hardest. And so I just want to differentiate here because a lot of times you could say that and like every person could be like, uh, yeah, I struggle with paying attention or I make mistakes often. That's a part of the human experience. But when it becomes a detriment to how you move through your life, that's when you want to start paying more attention. Another symptom is trouble focusing on long tasks or engaging in activities that require sustained mental effort. Things like preparing reports or completing forms or reviewing long papers. Here's a funny story. When I was doing my paperwork for figuring out if I had ADHD, (laughs) I got to the end and there was this quiz thing you were supposed to do. It was almost like a game. And I didn't even read the directions. I just hit start. And then I freaked out. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I didn't even read the directions. I just literally bypassed all the instructions. So then I hit backwards and I couldn't even get back to that page. And I was just dying because I'm like, the people that are analyzing these charts are probably seeing that while I was filling out this paperwork, I clicked out 32 different times. I opened 18 other tabs. It took me six hours to complete it. And I bypassed the instructions to do the game at the end and then canceled out the ability to even do the game because I didn't take the time to pay attention. Like I was just dying. So I'm like, I hope they're tracking all of these parts of this application process because just seeing how long it took me to finish that form alone should signify that there's likely uh, some neurodivergence in my brain. Another symptom is difficulty listening closely when someone is speaking, trouble following instructions or finishing workplace duties, organizational difficulties such as time management, keeping workspace and home clean or organizing tasks and activities, frequently misplacing common things such as keys, wallet, phone. This is literally my life. I feel like most days I spend at least 10 minutes trying to find something that I put in a spot where I thought I wouldn't lose it. Easily distracted by unrelated thoughts or stimuli, forgetfulness in daily activities such as paying bills, meeting deadlines, going to appointments or returning calls, trouble making realistic and manageable plans, trouble making decisions, procrastinating, doing things last minute, difficulty regulating emotions, especially when stressed. So these are all the different inattentive and internalized symptoms. You might not have them all. You might have a few. I feel like out of that list, there is a good chunk of those where I'm like, yes, that is me. And what's really interesting is that when I read these to Drew, he was like, no, you don't. And I was like, honey, do you know how long it takes 
for me to write one blog post. It takes me multiple days because I get so distracted. And like, so it's fascinating because a lot of times we internalize these things or we get so good at performing in spite of our difficulties that people have no idea, right? And I thought that was super interesting. So one stat that I thought was insane, and I'll link to the different sources where I'm pulling this data from, is that 50 to 75% of adult women with ADHD have been left undiagnosed until adulthood. 50 to 75% of women with ADHD have been left undiagnosed until adulthood. And they are three times less likely than males overall to receive a diagnosis according to the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. That is bananas, like three times less likely than males to receive a diagnosis. And I think that's fascinating because when I think about my own journey with this, I'm 34. I've been a high achiever. I've been a perfectionist for a lot of my life. And to think that I am just getting this diagnosis now and that 50 to 75% of adult women have been left undiagnosed. There are so many of us out there who are managing symptoms and internalizing behaviors that we think are normal because we haven't been diagnosed. Super crazy. So it's really easy. And one thing that I loved when I first met Tracy is to feel like these different symptoms, these different things are going to be a detriment to us. But one thing that I think is fascinating and why I'm not disappointed, but excited by my diagnosis is that I believe that there are a lot of ADHD superpowers. Here are just a few. So you are highly effective in a crisis. I remember when we had bought our first home in Wisconsin, I was finally working from home as a photographer. And one of my neighbors had epilepsy seizures and was pregnant. And I grew up around my dad, who was a volunteer firefighter and a paramedic, and my mom, who was a nurse, I grew up with just a lot of skills in crisis. I watched my parents navigate a lot of that where my dad would have a fire call and we'd have to wait in the car while he drove to help take care of people. And so when my neighbor would have these epileptic seizures, she knew I was working from home. She would shoot me a text and say something's about to happen. And I would run over to her house, call 911, get her medications ready grab her contact case. Like I was so highly effective in a crisis. And this happened multiple times to the point where they named their daughter that she was pregnant with Jenna. And people would just be like, wait, are you in the medical background? And I was like, no, like I just, my brain works really well in times of crisis. And now I'm like, maybe that's an ADHD superpower. Another superpower is you are extremely creative. High entrepreneurs, (laughs) specifically multi-passionate ones, People with ADHD are extremely creative. They think differently. They see outside of the box. The way that their brain thinks about things is different. And being extremely creative, man, that is an asset. You are also highly intuitive. I've talked about this a lot. It is actually another facet of my life that I've been exploring on a deeper level. I feel like my intuition has guided me so much on my path. I feel like a lot of my success is due to listening to my inner knowing and that intuition. And that is a superpower of people with ADHD. They're highly intuitive. They can feel things in a different way. They can feel energy in a different way. They have gut feelings in a different way. And I love that. People with ADHD are also really good at starting things. They are the super starters. They get the idea and they just get running. I mean, if you are somebody where like my team will laugh at me because I will literally get an idea and they're like, okay, and when is this going to happen? And I'm like, and it's happening tomorrow. Like I love taking something from idea to reality and people with ADHD are really good at starting And lastly, people with ADHD are laser focused. They have laser vision on the things that they are obsessed with. And when they get excited by something, it's like they can get into a deep flow state where it's like no time has passed. Like, have you ever found yourself where you are working on something you are so excited by? And like, all of a sudden you look at the clock and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even eat lunch today. Like I have just like no time has passed at all. That could also be a superpower of people with ADHD. It was really interesting because as I was preparing for this episode, I wanted to look for different women that you might know who also have ADHD. Emma Watson is one. Zoe Deschanel, love her. She has ADHD. Simone Biles, 
Lisa Ling. They all have ADHD. My friend, Marie Forleo, Shalene Johnson, Mel Robbins. The list goes on and on. Like There are so many powerful, successful, incredible women who have ADHD and also who share that they have ADHD. And I think that is so cool. And something that I have written down on a post-it note is that I am successful because of, not in spite of ADHD. I know something about you. You're busy. Chances are that you're listening to this podcast and you're probably doing something else too. Mastering the art of working out, walking the baby in the stroller, washing that sink full of dishes. And honestly, we get it. When you're having conversations with your customers, the same is probably true for them. They're juggling just as much. And it can be hard to give a true experience in just a moment, especially when we're all so distracted. HubSpot helps you go beyond the moment by connecting you and your team so you can access all the data you need to see the full customer picture, what motivates them, what their expectations are, and how you can blow them out of the water with your service. With powerful tools that connect marketing, sales, ops, and service, HubSpot's powerful CRM platform powers you and your team to transform customer moments into extraordinary customer experiences. Learn how HubSpot can help your business grow better at HubSpot.com. You know, the $300 Craigslist camera that started all of this? It was a Nikon. For the last decade, my life, my career, and photos have been fueled by Nikon. Nikon just introduced the camera creators have been waiting for. Meet the Z30, a camera with crisp 4K, worry-free autofocus, low-light capabilities, and quality sound. Does it sound like a dream come true? Well, it is. This is a camera made with creators, vloggers, and streamers in mind. Paired with the creator's accessory kit, you get extra features like a handheld grip, Bluetooth remote control, and an on-camera microphone. The Nikon Z30 will simplify your creator process and make you look like a pro. Get your Z30 today at NikonUSA.com slash gold digger. That's NikonUSA.com slash gold digger. Again, I feel like people's perception when you tell them that like you were diagnosed with something, because a lot of times it's a fair assumption is like, I'm sorry. But I think that a lot of my success, especially the more that I unpack what is ADHD in my life, how does it present itself? I think I'm successful because of it, not in spite of it. And I want to look at it as a superpower. I want to look at it as something to leverage that makes me different and unique. There is also this interesting research and something that I love that has suggested that there is this tendency for people who have ADHD to be self-employed or an entrepreneur. It's dominant in individuals with ADHD. And there's this whole Forbes article about like ADHD, the entrepreneur superpower. And I loved that because when you think about it, if we're highly creative, we're really good at starting things. We get laser focused on the things we're passionate about. We don't love the constraints of time and schedule and structure. It makes sense that a lot of us become entrepreneurs. We're in control of our schedule and our work. We allow ourselves to dive deep into those obsessions. Like It makes sense. And I love that. And I'm like, okay, so this is something that is really important for entrepreneurs to talk about if it is a trait that is present for a lot of entrepreneurs. So since I've been sharing about it a little bit, I did a questions box on my Instagram. And I said, you know, ask me anything. Again, I am at the very beginning of my journey. There is a very good chance that I might have said something in a wrong way as I'm learning about ADHD. There are a lot of things that I have to learn. But it's something that I want to start talking about now. And if it's something that is resonating, one, please let me know. But I also want to do more episodes as I learn more about this. Like, I feel like I am just uncovering the tip of the iceberg in what this is and what it means for me and how it shows up and how I can use it. And so I'm really excited. So let me know if this is a topic you want us to continue on. But when I did my questions box on Instagram, a lot of people were asking about how does this affect your relationship? And it's really interesting. So I had a conversation with Drew in preparation for this episode of like, okay, talk to me. Like, what is it like being married to me? 
let's be clear. Drew and I have known each other for 16 years. So this is all that we know together, like as friends, as spouses, as parents, like this is what we've known from the very beginning. However, when I Googled, what is it like to be married to someone with ADHD? Two words that popped up were frustration and annoyance. And I'm like, oh, crap. Generally, people with ADHD gravitate towards people who are organized and who pay attention to detail. Let me tell you a quick story. When Drew and I were just friends, we spent a a lot of time together in college. We had the same double major. We took a lot of our classes together. And I remember this one time I was over at his house studying and like the man, I mean, his bed, it was always perfectly made. And I remember I went over and I had this old school Kodak camera and the batteries were dead. And so I asked him, I said, do you have any AA batteries? The man opens up his closet and on the top shelf are like perfectly organized Tupperware containers with labels. And he pulls out one of the containers and inside is like all the different batteries. And I remember just being fascinated because if somebody were to ask me for a AA battery, I would be rummaging through 18 drawers, digging in my closet, probably deviating to just pulling the batteries out of something else because I couldn't find what I actually needed to. Like that is just my level of organization, aka I am very disorganized. And so I should have known that the man who had like the color coordinated closet and the labeled Tupperware has a different brain than I do. The article that I was reading talked about how the non ADHD person usually tends to over help to lessen the chaos. Like, I'm going to be honest, I'm slightly chaotic. And I laughed when I read that because I was like, that is totally true. When unhealthy, the non ADHD person can almost take on a parent role. And as I was learning about this, I actually thought this was really fascinating. Drew, sometimes when we argue, which is pretty seldom, I'm not going to lie, we get along really well. But when we argue, sometimes it is like he is scolding me. Like, you haven't put away your laundry. It has been five days. Or like, your suitcase is literally still packed and your trip was a month ago. When are you going to do that? And it's really interesting because I can see how that role happens, specifically with someone who is organized and they see things in black and white, Drew is an Enneagram one. And so there is a correct way and an incorrect way to do everything. And so I kind of get it where it's like the non ADHD person can almost take on this parent role because they start taking on the responsibility of a lot of the organization and like keeping things in check. And I get that. So I was like, Ooh, okay, this is a really good thing to know is like when I feel like Drew is talking to me, like he is my dad, this is him and his organization and the way his brain is wired coming out, being frustrated with the way that my brain and organization is, and I should say lack of organization. Now, long before I was diagnosed, I literally would have cracked jokes that like, if I was not married to Drew, if I did not live with Drew, I am pretty sure my house would look like a college frat boy lives there. Like if you come over to our house, our house is very clean and very organized. However, you will very quickly be able to spot my corners of the house. For example, right now, our laundry room, which is also kind of our mudroom here, has just like boxes of like packages and things. And like, I'm so overwhelmed by it that I just can't even touch it. Or my closet, you can absolutely see which side of the closet is Drew's and which side of the closet is mine. There are little stacks of like mail that I'm overwhelmed by that I need to get through, but that are just sitting there haunting me every single day. And so it is funny because Drew absolutely keeps our house organized, but you can definitely see where I am. I'm literally looking at my desk right now and there is a pacifier and a headphones case without the headphones, because I don't know where I put those headphones. And there are cords that I don't know what they go to. There is a stack of books next to me that I need to put away. You know, it's this is just how I work. And what's so interesting is that I have come a long way. So I want to acknowledge that like when Drew first met me, I remember he came over to my college house, which I shared with five other women. And my floor of my bedroom, you literally couldn't see the floor. Like I had clothes everywhere. And the funny thing is, is that even with that chaos, I knew where everything was. Like you could be like, Hey, Jenna, where is your turquoise crew neck sweatshirt? And I could be like, it is over to the left of the hamper underneath the jeans. Like I knew where everything was that controlled chaos worked for me. 
And so over the years, I want to give myself credit because I have massively shifted into craving a more tidy and organized life. But I still have my piles. I still have my suitcases. I still have that stuff. And what's really interesting is that that stuff really bothers Drew, but it doesn't bug me. Like I, I know where everything is and I know that it's there and it doesn't really bother me all that much. Do I feel better when it is put away? Absolutely. But it also doesn't take away from my life. And so being married to someone that doesn't have ADHD, it is this balance of like, I know that these things bother him. Therefore, I want to be a supportive spouse and do my best. But I also need to honor that like there are certain things that bother me and certain things that don't. And so it's like we have to meet in the middle often. And it's really fascinating because when I think about how my ADHD presents in my life, mostly I think about like how I really suck at normal things. So I'm really good at like very random things, but I also suck at things like running to the post office or filling up my car with gas or paying bills. Like that stuff really stresses me out. And I often delay doing it and I put it off, which then causes me more stress. Like I've talked about it on the show before, not really realizing that it's a trait, but like there are certain things in my life that I put off and put off and put off. And every single day I'm thinking about how I'm putting them off and it causes this anxiety. And then when I finally do them, I'm like, oh my gosh, that was not so bad. Why was I waiting so long? I should have just done it forever ago. I wouldn't have wasted so much worrying. And so it's really interesting. But Drew in his role has really stepped in and helped with a lot of admin stuff. And so it's been really great because a lot of the areas where I struggle, like I am so grateful that I have a partner. One of my team members has ADHD. And we were kind of preparing for this episode. And I sent her over my notes. And I was like, can you kind of peek at this? And she said, you know, it's really fascinating that you gravitated towards someone that doesn't have ADHD, because she married someone who does. And she's like, sometimes we feel like two children in an adult world. And like, we need somebody to come in and take care of us because neither of us are good at that. And I'm like, I would really struggle if that was my life. And so it's really interesting to see like, do you gravitate towards someone who's opposite you or very much like you? And I think, you know, opposites attract and also more of the same can feel um, comfortable and loving. So it's really interesting. One thing that has helped since my diagnosis, and I would say even before then is that we have a lot of conversations around our roles, like who is going to do what? And like, what does this distinction of roles look like. Like I am the kind of person who attempts to be helpful. Like I'll start the laundry and then I'll forget about it. And things like that can be really frustrating for Drew. So I've gotten to the point where like, if I'm going to do laundry, I have to set timers on my phone of like, okay, the wash is done. Get it in the dryer. Okay. The dryer is done or it needs to be turned back on. And so I've had to like figure out like, do not just be a super starter because that is a great trait in people with ADHD, but learn how to be a finisher and leverage tools that help you finish. And, you know, it's interesting because I think we are just at the beginning stages of unpacking as a couple. What does this mean? How does this look for us? But what's really interesting is that Drew sees things in black and white and things that bother him do not even occur to me to be bothered by them. So it is a lot of learning and communication on what each other needs and how do we show love and how do we support one another's desires. Like Drew is someone who is highly organized. He has a lot of tendencies of someone who might be on the spectrum of OCD. He's never been diagnosed with that, but he is someone who craves routine and consistency and organization And so you can imagine having someone who creates mess and isn't bothered by it, living with someone who sees things in black and white and absolutes, it can sometimes be a struggle. And so I feel like it's something that we are just unpacking at a higher level now. And I'm excited to see what comes out of it. So let's talk about ADHD in business. So one of the things is, is that I want for you, if you are listening to this and you either have ADHD or you suspect that you may... I want for you to think about how you can leverage it as a superpower. And it's so clear as day looking back now. But when I was thinking about this in terms of my career, I think that for most of my entrepreneurial journey before kids, I was able to work through or work with my ADHD and it didn't cause a lot of friction. However, 
once I had cocoa, and I've shared about this on the podcast so many times, but not through this lens. Once I had cocoa, I started to feel really overwhelmed. Like in the sense of I would get on my computer and I'd just sit there and I'd be like, I have no idea what to do. Like I know that there are a million things that need to be done right now. I don't even know what to do. And I would finish my days and I would have been working so hard and momming so hard. And I'd finish my days and be like, I don't even know what I got done today. Like I was working so hard. I can't even tell you what I completed. And that was when I realized I read the book called Rocket Fuel. There's also a book called Traction on this topic. And I realized like I am the visionary of the brand. I need an integrator. And I've talked about my integrator, Marissa, and how I brought her on shortly after having Coco and how that was so transformative for me. But now as I start to unpack that I have ADHD, I realize like this was a necessary role. Marissa is hyper organized. She is so good at tasking out different things. She sees the goal and breaks it down into bite-sized tasks. I literally need somebody to write my to-do list So that when I log on, I'm like, I know exactly what I need to do today. And I can mark things off. Having someone in a superpower role that helps me integrate and get the work done so that I can achieve has changed my life on so many levels. And so if you are someone who's listening to this, and you're like, I think I have ADHD. If there are opportunities for you to invite in that counterpoint for you, that organized person, that person who can give you tasks that can break down these big projects into these bite-sized pieces of work, I highly encourage it. Even if it is in the form of a part-time VA. Like I remember there's a chapter on my book about asking for help and it's called Pride's Utter Chokehold. And that chapter talks about my first hire years and years and years ago and how I hired a woman named Caitlin who I love and adore. And I had tendencies where I would get really overwhelmed with my inbox and I'd read an email and then I would just mark it as unread because I couldn't deal with it because I was too stressed out. And so looking at my team these days, most of the people that I've hired are now in these support roles and they're hyper organized. And there are members on my team who have ADHD who are very, very clear about that. And so we work with them in a different way. We help provide the organization that is necessary. There's a member on my team who we literally every single day send her like, here are the three bullets in orders of priority of what we need you to accomplish today. And that helps her with her brain prepared to do this incredibly creative work. And knowing that her brain is neurodivergent and knowing that she works in a different way helps us to support her. And in that same way, I've gotten a lot of support now. One of the things that I think is really important is to think about what roles do you need in your life or your business? What supportive roles do you need to help you be successful, to help you go deep into those superpowers, the laser vision, being highly intuitive, being extremely creative, being effective in a crisis, being a super starter? What kind of support do you need in order to maximize those superpowers of your ADHD and minimize some of the places where you might get stuck or frustrated? And so that is a great question to ask yourself. Or if you love someone who has ADHD, to ask yourself, how can I support them and support those superpowers in a way that allows them to be more effective? So another big question that came up as I was prepping is a lot of people were asking how and why would you get tested and evaluated? Like why at 34 years old, does it even matter? Like if you had a hunch, why not just claim it? Like what does that look like? Now, diagnosis can be helpful for so many different reasons. It can help you assess different resources. So medication, mental health support, it can help you get accommodations at school or work. For me, it also gave me a lot of peace of mind. Like once I had the diagnosis, I was like, okay, I'm not crazy. This is actually something that is a part of me in my life. And now I can dive in and learn knowing like, yes, this does pertain to me. It can also help you rule out other possible causes for your symptoms. Like many things can mimic ADHD, such as trauma or seizure disorders, but the treatments are different. And so it's really important to get tested or evaluated. And most people seek out a diagnosis when their ADHD traits start to have a significant impact on their daily lives or their levels of functioning. And so 
when I started to realize, especially in this slightly chaotic season, as we're building our home, finally going to have an office where I can close the door and focus. I think for me, I was recognizing like, I am in these environments that are not supportive of my focus. And I'm trying to do work while the kids are running around while I'm nursing Quinn, like all these things. And like, no wonder I feel like I'm not actually accomplishing or achieving what I thought I could. So how do you get it? So this is something that I did. So for adults, an ADHD diagnostic evaluation should be conducted by a licensed mental health professional or a physician. This can include clinical psychologists, physicians, psychiatrists, neurologist, family doctor, or any other type of physician. Even clinical social workers can help diagnose you. And what I would do is ask your personal physician for a referral to a healthcare professional in your community who is qualified to perform ADHD evaluations for adults. Not every doctor or psychiatrist is trained in ADHD and the evaluation process can be long and costly. So it may require some self-advocacy. So try to seek out medical professionals who have experience with ADHD specifically. So there is an amazing YouTube channel, ADHD in Women on YouTube. And I have been listening to her channel. And she was talking about how she was misdiagnosed because she went to a doctor and they were like, well, you do really well in school. You, you know, are perfectionist, like you don't have it. And she's like, no, like I have learned how to do well in school in spite of this. And her and her mom advocated for her until they were finally able to get the diagnosis that she thought. So just want to note with all things medical, like sometimes self-advocacy is so important to get the answers that you need. And what's really interesting is that ADHD cannot be diagnosed from a simple observation or a quick conversation. Diagnosis in adults can be really complex because many adults have learned to hide or mask many of their symptoms over the years. And so again, A lot of us are just used to performing under these circumstances, or we have learned how to deal with ADHD. And so that's why it's not just this like one quick, hey, here's what I noticed. Oh, yep, you've got it. It's kind of a more complex screening process. And something to note here is you have to have displayed some symptoms before the age of 12 to be diagnosed. So this part of the evaluation is very important. In some cases, those symptoms might have changed as you grew, but there was a lot of questions about me as a child. Like I remember. I was a very good student, but I had to work really hard to be a good student. And I remember for my brother, like school just came easy. Like I don't ever remember him studying. Like it just clicked for him. And for me, I had to study really hard in order to be a good student. And so while your symptoms might not present in the same ways now as when you were a child, most people that have adult ADHD had clear childhood signs that were likely missed. And lastly to note, and I thought this was super interesting, there is not like one single standardized test for ADHD. Instead, a qualified medical professional will use different evaluations and sources to diagnose it. This could include taking your personal history, gathering materials from your childhood, like report cards, noting your current challenges in adulthood, behavioral rating scales completed by you and loved ones who can attest to your behaviors, which is something that I did going through the DSM-5 checklist and testing for other medical and mental health conditions to rule out other causes or symptoms. So there's not just like one quick test. It's kind of a lot of different things that come into consideration. Now, a lot of people were asking, Jenna, are you going on medication? Right now, I'm choosing to not medicate at this point. And I want to make sure that if I ever do go on medication, I'm not ruling it out. I'm not opposed to it. I'm just personally not drawn to it right now. I am breastfeeding a baby. I'm just in a season of a lot of health changes. And so I just want to take this part of my life and work on understanding ADHD better and focusing on how I can set myself up for success, knowing how my brain works. Like One of the things I am most excited about for our new house is we are building an office space that is attached to the garage. So there will be zero house noise. The kids can't just run into the office. It is separate. So you have to go through the garage and this little vestibule to get to the office and upstairs. So it is very separate. And I think that it's going to be so incredible for me to have this focused space. And I think that I've just been thinking a lot about, especially too, I'm taking Time Genius again, Marie Forleo's course. And just talking about and learning about like, what is my best environment? Like, just like plants need a specific environment to thrive and grow. So do I. And so really kind of getting honest about that. So I am choosing to not medicate right now. It's not something I'm opposed to. It's something I'd actually be curious to try just to see how I felt. 
However, it's not something I am exploring right now. I'm just really learning a lot about ADHD. And I'm curious to see what my learnings lead me to. Now, finally, before closing, again, this episode could be very long, and I'm hoping to do more of them if this is something you want to hear about. I wanted to just share a few different things that are currently helping me. So one thing is now that I know that I have it, I'm looking more at like tools and ways of working that can really support this. So one thing is lots of timers and reminders on my phone and calendar. So if something is not on my Google calendar, I will not show up. So now that I know that, which is not something that I was good at before, like everything, anytime somebody invites me to do something, I'm like, put it on my calendar. It needs to go on my calendar. So setting a lot of timers and reminders. And what's hilarious is sometimes I'll set my alarm, like to remind myself to put my Invisalign back in or things like that. And my alarm will go off. And I'm like, wait, why is this going off? And then it takes me like 10 minutes to realize like, so I have to label them as well. There's also an app on my phone called Forest, and it really helps me focus. So essentially what it is, is you set a timer for focus time and you have this app open and it literally like during on the app, it like grows a plant. And so if you click out of the app, it kills the tree or the bush or the flower plant that is growing on your phone. And a lot of times I'll turn it on and I'll try to focus for like 15, 20 minutes. And five minutes in, I'll find myself grabbing my phone. And then when I open it and see it's on the forest app, I'm like, Oh my gosh, yes, I'm supposed to be focusing right now. And so that app has been super helpful. Keeping my phone on do not disturb. Sometimes this drives Drew crazy. Because they'll be like, I texted you. Why did you not respond? And I'm like, my phone is on do not disturb. I'm so sorry. I literally had no idea. And so my phone lives on these different like do not disturb and focus modes like 90% of the time. And then I try to almost batch respond to texts. And I also have like 400 unread texts, which would give a lot of people anxiety right now. But sometimes that's just how it goes. I've also been doing programs like Time Genius. So I'm back in the program. I was literally watching a module before I recorded this. And I am excited to go through the course again. So I went through it earlier this year. It was so transformative for me. And so now I'm going through it again, knowing that I have the diagnosis and also knowing that Marie has the diagnosis. And so it really helps for me to feel like I'm learning things that can help me. And so I've been digging back into that program and it's just been so good for me. Also just scheduling life admin things onto the calendar. So if I need to go to the post office, I am going to put it on my Google calendar. I'm now living and dying <laughs> with this Google calendar, but scheduling things in so that I, it just becomes a part of my thing. Like I have wanted to start scheduling like yoga class on my actual calendar so that it becomes just a part of my life. Because a lot of times I leave those things like where I'm like, Oh yeah, I really want to go Wednesdays at noon. And then all of a sudden, it's like Wednesday at 1230. I'm like, dang it, I forgot about that. So scheduling those life admin things onto my calendar. Another thing that's been so helpful is communicating with Drew on what is happening the next day and what I need. And since we're all under one roof, I'm recording this while Quinn is sleeping, Drew's doing a workout upstairs. The night before the next day, I just say like, here's what my schedule is tomorrow. Here's how I can help with the girls. Here's where I need support. And so that's something we didn't do before. And I think that resulted in a lot of butting of heads where I'd be like, dude, I got to record and you're mowing the lawn and it's so loud. And he's like, I didn't know. And so having that conversation, like doing kind of a weekly at a glance, here's what the week looks like. And here's what the next day looks like. Again, this is such a privilege, but we're building that separate office in our new home. And I'm so excited. I also got great noise canceling headphones recently. And that has been really helpful because if I can hear like literally as I'm recording this, I just heard Quinn squeal and I'm like, crap, she's awake from her nap. I got to go get her. And so that noise and distraction can really quickly derail me. I do brain dumps. We've talked about this. I don't know if there's a better way to talk about it, but when I start to feel overwhelmed or anxious, I open up a doc and I just write down all the things that are on my brain so that they are safe somewhere, whether I hand write them in my journal or I drop them onto a document. It allows my brain to release all the things it is trying to remember. And it helps for me to just feel like, okay, now I can organize these things. Now I can sort through them. Now I can ask for support, like get these thoughts out of my brain. And then lastly, using different organization systems. So we use monday.com for my team. I've talked about it a lot. It is something where our entire team is on it. So I can look at my entire business on there. I can see everybody's to-do list. I can see things like our content calendar. I can see tasks that are coming up. There's so much. 
If you want to check out Monday, I cannot recommend it more. I've been at like super expensive masterminds and showed people like pulled up my laptop and I'm like, here's how we use Monday and people are blown away. So if you want to see how we use it on my team, go to jennalovesmonday.com. That's jennalovesmonday.com. It's been so helpful. We also use a system called Front and that is for email management. And so my team can assign emails to me. We can comment back and forth about the emails without adding and replying to the email and getting 8 million more emails. And so it just simplifies things like that. And so those types of things that help me organize have been really pivotal in my success. So this went longer than I was planning. But again, this is just the beginning for me. And it's something that I'm excited about and I'm slightly relieved by. And I feel like I am just getting to know myself again on a whole new level. And to me, it is just affirming. And I feel like the more that I learn, the more that I can see different traits and how they have been pivotal in my success and also how they maybe frustrated me or people that love me. And this awareness is just bringing like a whole new level to who I am. I'm like really excited about it. And so if you are somebody who's listening and you're like, Oh my gosh, this sounds like me. I would just encourage you if you are able to pursue a diagnosis or a next step, I would 100% recommend it. There's something affirming when you learn more about yourself and your specific body and your brain. And I feel like it just gives you more ownership with how you want to move through life and leverage it as a superpower. I think a lot of my success is because of my ADHD, not in spite of it. And so I hope that this conversation lets you in to a little bit deeper part of my life these days, but also maybe unlock something for you like Tracy did for me unknowingly over a year ago. I'm so excited to share more about this as I learn more. And of course, I absolutely love hearing from you. So if you have not yet subscribed or left a review, those are two huge ways you can support the show. If you are loving these more kind of candid types of conversations, I would love to hear that. I have just been feeling this pull to deliver in a different way on this podcast. And it's been a lot of fun for me and I've really enjoyed it. And so I'd love to hear if you are enjoying just this more candid approach to the podcast. And until next time, gold diggers, keep on digging your biggest gold. And thank you so much for listening to another episode of the podcast. I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because you just finished another episode of the Gold Digger podcast. Did that go by way too fast for anyone else? If you want more, head over to golddiggerpodcast.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's sponsors. And if you're looking for a new crew of movers and shakers like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive community for gold diggers on Facebook. The link's waiting for you at golddiggerpodcast.com. 